Right, thank you, thank you very much. And welcome back again today. We have an extremely tight schedule um, today with, with some absolutely wonderful treats coming. Uh, so we do need to start on time. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Robert Eisenstein, who is the president of the Santa Fe Institute. And all of you who were here yesterday, of course, would have uh, seen him and met him. Um, Bob received his PhD in experimental nuclear physics from Yale, but he tells me that he now describes himself as a particle physicist. Um, in 1992, he moved to the National Science Foundation as director of the physics um, division, and then in June 2003, um, he became president of Santa Fe. And in fact, it was shortly after that that he first came over to the LSE and the beginnings of this symposium were set. This time, um, it was June last year when we, we started discussing it. Um, his most recent research interests concern various issues in high energy physics in, and in the application of information theory to problems in physical science. However, one other thing you may or may not know about him is that he has a very deep commitment to education at all levels. Um, today, he will talk to us about future directions in complexity science at the Santa Fe Institute. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much, Eve. It's a pleasure to see everybody here this morning, and I uh, look forward to meeting those of you who I didn't meet yesterday. So I'm going to give you in the next 20 minutes a brief overview of what goes on at the Santa Fe Institute. And uh, surely one of the nicest things that goes on there is the fact that you can spend a lot of time in a beautiful part of the United States uh, enjoying the countryside and hiking and so forth. And there's no doubt that that accounts for a good bit of our attractiveness. SFI is 20 years old this year. Uh, it was begun in 1984. It is a nonprofit, private institution. Uh, and if there's one thing that describes SFI better than anything else, SFI is all about boundaries and edges and frontiers. And th that's what it is that we try to do. Uh, our founders included some extremely uh, uh, prominent scientists, three Nobel laureates, as you can see there. And George Cowan, a very prominent scientist himself, uh, was our founding president. George is, is still at SFI and extremely active, uh, uh, young, 85 years old, uh, do, doing extremely well. Um, SFI, I think, uh, is quite a unique place. Its research is entirely interdisciplinary. If what you want to do when you come to SFI is sit in your office and f finish the book you've been working on for five years, uh, we're not so interested in that. We want people who, are, who will come and, and really work at the boundaries, work at the frontiers. SFI focuses entirely on theoretical research. We don't have any laboratories. And we do mostly mathematical and uh, computational modeling of the systems that we, we look at. Uh, I mentioned already we have no laboratories. We have no departments. Our faculty does not have tenure. Everybody who comes to SFI eventually leaves and leaves after a rather short period of time. That's sort of the ethos of the place. We keep, we keep the pot boiling, keep uh, people a little bit uncomfortable. That, that's sort of the idea, is to try to generate creativity and have people thinking all the time. Uh, nonetheless, it's quite a uh, warm place. It's uh, a lot of fun to be there. And uh, I think the greatest tribute is that uh, when people have to leave, they don't want to. Uh, SFI has, uh, another thing that makes us quite unusual is that we have very strong connections to the business community. That was actually one of the things that attracted me most to the job. I spent quite a few years in, in, in uh, university life, quite a few years in the government, and joining the Santa Fe Institute is as close as I'm going to get to the business world, but it's been an extremely interesting uh, thing from that point of view. So we have a, a, a very strong business network of uh, almost 55 companies who, who belong to it. We'll, I can only show on this slide about 50% about, uh, uh, of them. And so uh, I'm sorry to say that if, if your company's logo isn't there, it's uh, not an oversight. It's just that it, it, they just won't all fit. So uh, we uh, have a board of trustees. It's mostly uh, business people and philanthropists. Uh, also quite a few scientists. 
We have a science board of about 40 people that includes uh, five Nobel laureates. We have an external faculty of about 70 people who come for uh, periods of time from a week up to a month, uh, on almost on an annual basis. And then we have uh, 15 resident faculty, 15 postdocs, and about six students. And as I say, all those people, even though they're called resident faculty, uh, they do move on at some point. Uh, and then we have quite a few uh, research visitors every year, about 100 or so. One of the things that SFI specializes in is a sort of a continuous uh, melange of workshops and working groups. We have roughly one a week, uh, all year long. And so there's a constant stream of, of intellectual activity across all of science, basically. We, we do everything from medicine to physics to social science to almost whatever you can think of. So it's a very fun place, very, vigor very invigorating. We have a very significant uh, international program. I'm not going to spend any time talking about it today, uh, but it includes activities not only with our uh, equal partners uh, in the intellectual world, such as uh, uh, the London School and, and other, other uh, organizations in what I might call the first world, but also many strong connections in the developing world as well. Uh, SFI is unusual, at least in the United States, for the fact that only 25% of our money comes from the federal government. The rest of it comes from private sources of one kind or another. So this is uh, hard work for all of us because we are, frankly, uh, uh, always working hard to generate a revenue stream. It's sort of the ultimate soft money organization in a way. Uh, and that also can be quite invigorating and a little scary from time to time. But uh, it is unusual in the sense that we have so, such a small amount of federal support. At the beginning, it was the other way around. But over the years, due entirely to my predecessors, the former presidents, we've been able to shift to a, a largely a private funding source. So uh, what does SFI do exactly? Well, as I've said already, we emphasize interdisciplinary science. It's often based on complex systems analysis that you know already. We try to attract visionary scientists and students from all over the world, and we do, a big, I hope, a good job in disseminating the information that we create. So uh, sometimes I'm asked, well, what is complexity all about? And I like to uh, talk about this ruler a little bit, and you can see that uh, it starts from on the upper left with objects that we like to think of as being simple, although probably they're not so simple, uh, going all the way down through more and more complex entities, uh, atoms, molecules, amino acids, simple life forms, fish, mammals, early man, mind consciousness, language, and human social behavior. The traditional modality in science through most of human existence has been to try to simplify all the time, simplify being moving uh, from right to left on the ruler, trying to reduce things to their simplest components. And that is a very valuable thing to do, and it's still a very valuable thing to do, no, no question about it. But what's really happened over the last uh, 20 to 25 years is the realization that one can learn a good bit by turning the thing on its head and moving along the ruler the other way. Uh, my favorite example from the physics world is if you think of an ideal gas with Newtonian point particles interacting, of course each of those point particles moves according to Newtonian laws, and those laws are time reversal invariant. On the other hand, when you put Avogadro's number of particles together in a container, then all of a sudden uh, the system uh, does not obey a reversible physics. It's not time reversal invariant. And that emergence of the second law of thermodynamics, largely out of a combinatorial, combinatorial reasoning process, is a very good example of an emergent behavior. That's one we happen to understand the dynamics of. And many of the others that we want to talk about on this route are, are, are cases where we don't understand the dynamics of what's going on. But nonetheless, that's a good example of an emergent behavior. So uh, if I were being philosophical about it, I would uh, try to quote to you a uh, famous uh, Western explorer, John Muir, who said that uh, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, you find it hitched to the rest of the universe. And that's sort of uh, what SFI is uh, trying to capitalize on. So uh, what we do is multidisciplinary collaborations, as I've tried to indicate on this slide. Uh, uh, I was very taken by the fact that 
uh, I think at the first business network meeting I ever went to at the Santa Fe Institute, I listened to a gentleman from Eli Lilly named Alf Bingham, and he talked about a phenomena that he refers to as the talk radio phenomena. And what that is, is you're sitting in your car and you're driving through London traffic in rush hour, and you're listening to a jazz program, and uh, the announcer comes on and says, well, uh, that was Ella Fitzgerald. We all recognize that voice, but I don't know who the rest of the people on the recording were. Let's go on to the next song. The next song goes on. He comes back at the end and he says, well, a gentleman called in while the record was on and told me who all the accompanists were and who the, uh, and when, when the recording took place. That's an example of the talk radio phenomena. Namely, there's all this information out there if only you know how to get your hands on it. And that's sort of what SFI is trying to do to bring people together in this sort of talk radio kind of modality so that a computer scientist might learn something from a physicist or a physicist might learn something from a biologist that changes the way they do research. So uh, that's the talk radio phenomenon. By the way, Eli Lilly has turned that into a money-making proposition. And if I have a second at the end, I'll show you a slide that tells you how they do it. Uh, what are some of the science impacts from the Santa Fe Institute over the years? And by the way, I do not mean to imply that we have exclusive credit or exclusive rights to these ideas, but we did play a role in germinating them and promulgating them. They've gone on to, to heights that vastly exceed what happens at SFI, no doubt about it. But these are areas in which we, we did play a role. You'll hear from Jeff West right after me, I think, talking about scaling as a way to understand complex behavior. Uh, many aspects of nonlinear dynamics, aspects of network dynamics. A lot of what I'll say this morning is about networking. Uh, Agent-based modeling, I will not discuss very much, nor will I talk about theoretical biology and immunology. You'll hear some of that from Jeff. We've also done a lot of work on the studies of origin of language, uh, modeling economic and social interactions, the economy as a complex system, and ideas about innovation, evolution and robustness. So I'm not going to, uh, if, if Jeff were not immediately following me uh, to give his talk, I would spend some time talking about allometric scaling. I, I won't say much about it since he will spend a great deal of time. But the basic notion in his uh, talk will be that uh, to try to account for a very remarkable phenomenon that's been known, I guess, for about 100 years that if you plot the, uh, the metabolic rate uh, of all the mammals known in the world, you find that the metabolic rate scales like the mass of the animal to the three quarters power. Now, you can make a sort of a naive argument that would generate mass to the two thirds power if you, for example, took surface area to volume as the measure of meta met 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 metabolic rate. But that's not the way it goes. It goes like the three-quarters power. And uh, it's very uh, robust and, and very clear that that's the case. And I'll leave it to Jeff to tell you why that is true. But let me just take a minute and show you uh, the data that he will, I'm sure, talk about. This is a log-log plot. And you can see in the upper right a blue line with many dots around it. Those are the known mammals going from sperm whale to the shrew. And the line that goes through those points is a three-quarters power line. Now, the mammals have a circulatory system, and Jeff will describe it to some extent. What's also fascinating is if you go into the cellular world, where the circulatory system is not nearly so clear, there aren't capillaries and veins and hearts and aortas and all that, you still see a three-quarters power law, even though there's an offset between the two lines. And Jeff, again, will, send, will spend some time uh, talking about that. Let me not go on about it. Let me just, uh, I hope he doesn't mind me sort of stealing his punchline. But it turns out that you can understand what's going on here based on network theory. And uh, the ideas uh, seem simple, but of course they're only simple in retrospect. Uh, at all scales, life is sustained by hierarchical, fractal-like branching network systems. Circulatory, respiratory, neural, mitochondrial, networks. These networks are space filling, that is they reach all the cells in the organism. Their terminal branch units, for example capillaries, are the same size within a given taxonomic group. 
and natural selection has optimized these networks. That is to say, for example, cardiac output is minimized. So these seem like rather simple ideas. They are simple once you understand them, and they can account for what I just showed you. And as I say, Jeff will tell you in much greater detail in a few minutes. Uh, you can talk about scaling research in lots of other domains. And this is a, a graph that shows you uh, some of the efforts that uh, Jeff and his collaborators have embarked upon. And again, in the interest of time and because of his uh, following talk, I won't say much about it, except to notice that scaling behavior starts at the molecular level and can extend all the way up through the biosphere. It's this idea of scale invariant networks that maintain their same characteristics as you, as you move from one length scale to another. Networks are uh, everywhere, and they're particularly prominent in the work that the Santa Fe Institute does. We're very proud of the fact that uh, uh, Duncan Watts, as, as a young investigator, uh, learned some of the ideas that he has made now popular in, in two books that, at least in the United States, are very well known, uh, Small Worlds and Six Degrees, uh, the notion that networks are, are not, as you might think, random, and not, as uh, uh, Paul Erdos uh, said, uh, random, and Paul Erdos was a very prominent mathematician, and so uh, disputing his wisdom on this subject took some courage, but it turns out that it's true. So let me just uh, say a little bit about this. Again, uh, I, I can't possibly duplicate the, the wonderful talk that Chris Barrett gave us yesterday about uh, network theory being applied to a variety of social systems. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what goes on in uh, contact networks applied to epidemiological uh, research. Again, Chris did say something about this. This work has been carried out by Lauren Myers and, uh, and her collaborators. And uh, basically what you want to do is, again, uh, both obvious and very important. You'd like to be able, before things get out of control, predict the size and demographics of disease outbreaks. And by the way, I'm not limiting myself to human diseases, but also diseases that take place in the agricultural framework. You'd like to have controls, understand how to develop control strategies. It's real important to remember that you can't experiment with people. Uh, it's either impossible, it's almost certainly, almost, usually unethical. And uh, so you'd like a mathematical model that can help you do this, but do it in a reliable way. And by the way, uh, you know, predicting the obvious is a, is a good thing to do to check that you're on the right track, but if all you do at the end of the day is predict the obvious, then you really haven't made a lot of progress. So you want models that are going to be able to do things that are, are uh, uh, both reliable and uh, predictive. So uh, the traditional approach, as uh, uh, Chris indicated briefly yesterday, is to compartmentalize the problem in a very uh, abstract and not very realistic way into groups of susceptibles, infecteds, and people who've recovered. And the traditional approach in epidemiology has been to use differential equation analysis to do this. There's nothing wrong with differential equations. They, they work very well but they gloss over all of the subtleties. They gloss, gloss over all of the uh, uh, details, really. Uh, and they describe the gross behavior, but, but, and that's important, but they don't do much more. So as Chris indicated yesterday, a much more realistic approach is the notion of using contact networks in which you divide the world, again, into susceptibles, infected, and recovered, but you can spread these nodes all over a topological map. You can load demographic data into these nodes, and you can, based on the strength of the interaction between the nodes, you can cre create a very realistic model of what's going on. And, and Chris showed you several examples of that yesterday. <coughs> so uh, obviously what you want to do is to build a realistic network. You want to try to predict the spread of disease through the network and then you want to quantify the impact of various uh, intervention schemes. Uh, Chris indicated far better than I can with this slide how complicated that can be and how detailed uh, your analysis can be if you want it to be. The real trick in this business is to avoid being overwhelmed by the combinatorics of it. You can't just take all possible solutions, there are just too many. 
So you have to have filters in place that allow you to make reasonable selections uh, out of all the combinatoric possibilities. This is just a cartoon. It just shows that the world is a complicated place. There are households, there are schools, there are hospitals, there are working places, and all of these have their own internal structures which uh, make the problem very, very uh, messy com in a combinatoric sense. Uh, but uh, you can have success with these models, and uh, Chris showed you some of that yesterday. Uh, Lauren Myers and her collaborators report the same sort of thing. But uh, it can be extremely important from a, a sociological point of view. You can do things like understand when a disease outbreak becomes an epidemic. You can uh, try to determine what the probability is that it will turn into a large epidemic. You can try to understand the risk of an, of an epidemic as how, depending on how many cases there are initially and on and on and on. But you can't do it uh, in the normal differential equation sense. You have to have a microscopic model of this sort. Okay, so now let me uh, shift gears completely and talk a little bit about explaining the financial, the regularities in financial markets using methods of physics uh, and ecology, sometimes fondly referred to as econophysics. And again, I will not say very much about this because my colleague Don Farmer will speak to you for an hour a little bit later this morning on just exactly this subject. So uh, I, I only will gloss over uh, in a very light way what he's going to say. So the uh, basic idea is, if you look at the behavior of financial markets, you see that they, ha they display rather striking statistical properties. And one example that uh, I think Don will talk about today is the notion of clustered volatility. That is, the size of price changes on one day are strongly correlated with price changes on previous days. It's a little bit like looking out the window and saying that the weather today is a lot like it was yesterday. Uh, most of the price changes, in fact, are not driven by news arrival. And a good example of that is uh, on October 19th, I think it was, 1987, the U.S. stock market lost 25% of its value in one day. Um, those of us who were involved in the stock market remember it very well. Um, and in fact, in one of the things that uh, I hope Don will show today, I don't know if he will or not, is he has a compendium of what the conventional wisdom was at the time in the New York Times and other, other publications about why this great event had happened. Mm -hmm. And it was a complete sort of mishmash of kind of non-reasons non about why this might have happened. Uh, and he has a, a compendium like that for other big excursions as well. And it's, it's really quite interesting to see that. So the, po the point is that these things are somehow internally generated by the statistics of the market. So he'll say more about that. SFI takes a quite a different approach to these problems than what is done normally. And most uh, economic models assume that all, ra all investors are rational and the markets are behaving in an ideal fashion. And Doan and his collaborators assume just the opposite, that uh, individuals are, uh, uh, in fact, what, what is happening is the individuals, of course, are making their own choices based on what they perceive locally as the most rational thing to do. On the other hand, there's so many investors that the, end, the behavior ends up being essentially that of a, a random uh, set of particles making a, uh, decisions based on zero intelligence. In any case, you can actually uh, do this, and you can then uh, try turning on small amounts of intelligence in various ways to see how it affects the market and what, what will happen. And you can um, uh, use these strategies to understand or, or to predict what markets might do. And by the way, what's, what's interesting about this is not so much that people want to make money. I mean, everybody wants to make money. But uh, the first goal here is really to be able to provide guidance to the markets so that when they see trades moving in certain ways, they can actually take corrective action to try to prevent enormous market swings. So uh, Don, I'm sure, will say more about that when he speaks, and I, I won't say more about it now, uh, except to say that uh, they are using an enormous data set from the London Stock Exchange, one with 350 million records, to try to retrospectively understand what was going on at various times uh, over, over the time in which this uh, data set was accumulated. Future work? Well, 
We'll try to do it with uh, agent-based simulations rather than zero intelligence models. And the bigger agenda later on is to try to extend these studies into uh, work on social evolution. So uh, the last example I'd like to give you this morning is something we have not heard much about uh, yesterday and will not hear more any more today as far as I understand it. And that is the work of something called the Santa Fe Institute Consortium. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary, multi-site program to try to understand how children learn and whether or not you can describe their learning process in a quantitative way. And so basically the idea is to bring physical scientists and modelers and mathematicians and statisticians into contact with what amounts to a very powerful suite of instruments out there, magnetic resonance imaging, functional MRI, electroencephalography, magnetoencephalography, uh, PET scanning, all kinds of uh, uh, very wonderful instruments that exist that today, and to try to see whether with children one can understand how brains develop. And I show these two pictures because these are the two people at SFI who are uh, most, most directly involved, and they also happen to be former presidents of the Santa Fe Institute, George Cowan on the left over there, and Ellen Goldberg. So uh, how will the studies be conducted? Well, there'll be two cohorts of kids, one from six months to five years, and the second cohort from 10 years to 15 years. And the kids will all undergo longitudinal studies, monitoring behavior, and trying to understand how the brain develops uh, as they grow older by uh, looking at uh, basically testing that's applied in linguistic, cognitive, and social areas. And they will be studied with these instruments, as I mentioned. And uh, you know, that's how it will work. It's a long process. It takes uh, each one of these cohorts is supposed to last roughly five years. So you can see we're going to be at this for a while. Okay, so uh, the last thing I want to uh, talk about today <coughs> is to uh, <coughs> say a little bit about where SFI might be going uh, in the future. Now, we had a uh, scientific retreat or retreat about science uh, in October, where we all got together and talked about what might be interesting frontiers in the future. And we're going to have a, an interaction with our science board to, I hope, to validate what it is we've come up with uh, in, in May, just next month. Uh, and so I thought I would just sort of conclude by telling you a little bit about where we think we're going. So uh, the first one up there is, are there fundamental laws of biology? Well, there are fundamental laws of physics. You can even write them down. It's not even so hard to write them down. It doesn't take many pages. And they do a very good job of describing a lot of what goes on in the world. But are there fundamental laws of biology? Well, Jeff will tell you this a little bit, on, a little bit later on about one possible fundamental law of biology, that is its reliance on networks and on scaling. There are other candidates. You can think of uh, the Pauli principle in chemistry, which determines, it determines how, how the atom is built and how chemicals interact with each other. That's certainly a fundamental law of biology. Uh, but are there others? Is there a reason why the Krebs citric acid cycle is the way it is? Are there similar citric acid cycles in, uh, in other, in other uh, forms of life? So that's the kind of question. Uh, another one is how do biological systems store retrieve and use information. That is to say, how should you think about how a cell computes? Now, one thing a cell does not do is it does not compute a number. That's not what it's doing. It may not even mimic a Turing machine very well. What a cell does is to sit there and try to do computation or information processing related to metabolic me metabolism, and reproduction, uh, protein folding, all of the things that go on in a cell are driven by uh, information. Uh, in addition, uh, that information is enormous in volume. And somehow, most of the time, cells do this in a very reproducible way. There are, the error rates in biology are really quite small. Or if they're large, 
the cells know how to recover from that. So uh, how is it that all of that goes on? So that's the second one. The third one is uh, how do ideas about complexity, uh, entropy, and the physics of inter information interact with one another? Um, SFI held a couple of workshops about this idea in the late 1980s, maybe early 1990s. But uh, there's a lot that's happened since then in this very interesting area. And it, I mean, it really sort of foreshadows uh, the notion that ideas about information and about computation are maybe even more fundamental than we realized before. And they seem to be everywhere. Uh, in my particular area, cosmology and particle physics, there's now, these days, a lot of discussion about uh, what happens to the information that falls into a black hole. You have a black hole out there in the universe, and you throw a phone book into it, let's say. Well, the phone book has a lot of information in it. What happens to it? Uh, well, you know, and I won't get into the details, but it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, conversation that we're going to have about that. Uh, the fourth one down is, uh, can one model innovation or robustness or evolution? So let me just uh, take one second to tell you that I spent 11 years in the federal government in the United States, and uh, a lot of the time I interacted with congressmen and representatives and uh, staffers, uh, and they're very smart people, very, very smart people. Uh, but they do not understand and this is not meant to be a slam against them at all, the no notions of innovation. Uh, basically going to them and making an argument about why you should invest in science when you cannot predict the outcome. This is a hard sell. And uh, I many times wished uh, that I had convincing explanations to talk to uh, a, a congressman about how it, how it is impossible to predict innovation, why you cannot just order up a magnetic resonance imaging machine or a GPS system or a laser. Um, so uh, we won't be able to predict innovation either by studying it, but you might be able to understand its impact if you could study it in a little bit more uh, quantitative detail. I've just said a little bit about whether we can understand or not how the human brain develops in a quantitative way. I don't think I need to say more about that. I don't know much more than what I told you anyway. Uh, one of the things that is of great interest at SFI these days is whether one can usefully simulate the interaction between Earth systems, Earth's physical systems, the oceans or the environment uh, or its physical systems, uh, with human systems. Uh, this would be uh, taking the kind of work that Chris Barrett described and moving it to an even larger scale. Uh, trying to understand whether one can really be predictive about this. For example, uh, you know, the United States government will not sign the Kyoto Accords. Well, why not? Well, the reason why not is because, and they, this is partly true, I even have to agree with it, the science behind the Kyoto Accord, Accords are not, is, are not, is not very well known, not very well understood. That's true. So what would it take in terms of understanding the science beyond the behind the Kyoto Accords to induce governments like the United States and Russia to sign the Kyoto Accords. Uh, the last one I'll talk about here just briefly is uh, the notion of whether one can ameliorate civil conflict through the study of model systems. One of the uh, uh, resident faculty members at the Santa Fe Institute is a woman named Elizabeth Wood. She's uh, in, her, in her real life is a professor of politics at Yale now. She was at NYU until very recently. And she studies um, the civil conflicts in areas of the world like Colombia, trying to understand why certain civil conflicts are resolved more or less amicably and remain robust and, and are resistant to uh, breakdown, whereas other civil conflicts like the Middle East or, and for a long time, the conflict in Northern Ireland why those conflicts are much more difficult to resolve. So uh, if I had more time, I could say a little bit more about it, but I promised Eve I would finish on time, so I will. And so the last thing I guess I'd like to show you is uh, a little cartoon. Uh, 
we, we want to keep SFI uh, existing in a permanent state of revolution. Uh, thank you very much.